Um, when we were collecting topics earlier, in, I guess late in 2018 or 2019, several people asked for uh, tutorials on grounding. And it is a very important topic, and it's a fairly complex topic as well. You wouldn't think grounding is very complex, but uh, after having studied it for five or six years, I've come to that conclusion. Um, so I'm going to try to cover um, some basic ham station grounding principles. Uh, lightning is a key aspect of grounding. In fact, it's probably true that if you create a system that is robust to nearby strikes in your yard and that kind of stuff, you automatically pretty much will have a good RF ground. And we'll talk about the different types of grounds and why you need them. But, uh, it's a very important topic, so we'll actually spend uh, some time on that because to handle, to create a system that's robust to lightning strikes by definition means it's going to be a pretty good RF ground system for your ham shack. Uh, we'll look at some grounding configurations and pros and cons of a couple of different key configurations. And um, Larry sent me an email saying, Mike, will you please cover these topics? And there were about four in there. And they're all very good. I appreciate the suggestions. So I put, I put those topics at the very front of the presentation because they're so germane to new hams and so on and so forth. And so we'll cover some of the basics of, of the RF grounding and the in the front end of the presentation. The liability of that, uh, and this is actually a present, this uh, presentation actually started about five years ago. I gave this presentation about five years ago. Uh, many of you probably don't remember that at this point. Uh, but I've added to it to address the issues that Larry wanted to cover. And so as a result, I have to drop some things off of that. Now, I'm, I always hate to drop information off of your graph slides, because you can always take these slides home and take a look at them and maybe get more information out. So I've created, I've taken a whole section <coughs> of this presentation on grounding materials, components, and assembly techniques. And I'm going to show maybe a picture or two, and I brought some show and tell things to show you. But it's going to be sort of a minimal treatment, and there is quite a bit of description in there, so I encourage people to take a look at the slides later uh, if they want. But we're going to, we're going, we'll get through, through as much of this as possible, but I doubt that we'll get uh, all the way through. And we will have notes on the website. Yeah, the website. yeah. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I've been working as an electrical engineer for about 40 years. Makes me sound really old, doesn't it? Like <laughs> I don't feel that <laughs> way, <laughs> nonetheless it is. And uh, I'm, I've been doing RF and microwave integrated circuit design for a long time, working with various types of semiconductor devices. And, um, Primarily focused on ultra wide band samplers and high speed A to D's. And that's that's a different field entirely from grounding. In fact, I was surprised how much I didn't know about grounding when I first started studying this topic about five or six years ago. Um, I'm currently with Technovations Incorporated. I worked part time, I retired full time a couple of years ago. And uh, I got my amateur extra license in 2014. So we'll now uh, look at a few of the basic uh, principles of grounding. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to define some terminology. Uh, a safety ground is the green wire and the three-prong three outlet. And that actually goes back to your electrical panel and, is gr and it reaches the electrical panel ground along with the neutral conductor, the white conductor. Um, and that sets the potential of to earth of both your neutral and your ground. Now the neutral is what carries the current. The ground is not supposed to carry current ideally and that's what makes it useful because this potential doesn't float around with the load currents in your power plant. The NEC requires this to be bonded to any other ground pass. Uh, there's a couple key NEC rules and we'll review them concerning grounding. But this is one of the key ones and I'll show you why you want to do that. There's lightning reasons to do that lightning protection reasons, and there are safety reasons from shock hazards. Uh, a lightning ground, on the other hand, is an earth ground connection network for sunny, shunting humongous currents. And I'll show you how big these currents are. They're mind-boggling. Uh, after you look at the size of these currents and how quickly they operate, you wonder 
how in the world can we ever protect our ham shack from lightning? Um, and you really can't protect a direct strike on your antenna, but you can protect from, say, it hitting a tree in your yard or hitting an automobile in your yard or something like that. Uh, and so we'll discuss ways to do that. Earth ground is basically the, the ground rod which goes into the earth and tries to dissipate that energy, whether it's RF energy or lightning energy. And lightning, by the way, is a very broadband signal. It's just a pulse. And if you looked at the, uh, if you attended the Fourier transform presentation that Chip and I did last year, you realize that a pulse is just a broad spectrum of frequencies occurring all at once. So <clears throat> that's why lightning, grounding for lightning also is a really good system usually for RF ground. Finally, we have RF ground, which usually involves connections from the radio equipment to the earth ground via a single point ground panel. We'll talk about that. And it's intended to provide a low impedance path for RF currents um, at the operating frequency that you happen to be using. So um, that's a quick review of terminology. Uh, why do we ground? Okay, what are the key reasons for grounding? And I tried to, uh, I first sat down and just figured out from first principles why I ground. And then I went and looked at some various literature and found out that, lo and behold, most of the experts have exactly these same points. So that's reassuring. Um, the first reason is an AP, AC power safety ground. It's required by the NEC for human safety. Your ham shack ground needs to be connected to your power panel ground. The NEC requires all building structure earth ground terminals, and the two that we're primarily talking about in most residences are the ham station ground and the AC power panel ground. But there are other grounds. If you have cable TV coming in your home, there's a ground there. Half of the cable TV installations are probably defective. I hate to tell you this, but these installers, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so they'll, they'll run a cable in your house and expose you to lightning problems and transients and everything else. You may need to go outside and take a look at it. Um, the second reason you do this is lightning protection. Um, that's a human safety issue as well. There's a lot bigger voltages and it will just literally kill you instantly. You might have a second or two on your way out, if you touch 120 <laughs> volts or 240, you're not going to have any chance to, uh, to survive a, light, a, a powerful lightning strike directly on your person um, or coming in through wiring in your, in your home. Um, all outdoor antennas, masks, anything sticking up into the sky is a magnet <coughs> for lightning. There is something called lightning rods. If you go out and look at any of the ranches in Colorado, they all have lightning rods. This has been around. There's a lot of misconceptions about grounding and so on and so forth. And uh, this is one of them, that lightning rods don't work. They actually do work, and I'll show exactly how they work. But um, anything that's sticking up in the sky that's metal has to be grounded according to the NEC. Finally, you have RF ground reasons to ground your ham station. Uh, it depends on your antenna. We'll talk about how it depends on your antenna. It depends specifically on the balance of the currents in your antenna, but it may impact your ham station RF performance. And it may be required, a good ground may be required for the best performance out of your ham station. And that includes noise and interference. Your no the noise floor and the interference level of all the radiating computers and everything in your house and your neighbor's house and all that, they set the noise floor what would be called the coherent mad noise floor of your system. And you want to get those down. And the way to do that is to <coughs> ground properly. <coughs> now, <coughs> I mentioned before that if you have a good lightning ground, usually it's a pretty good RF ground. And that's true. And a lot of times, these are just considered the same system. <coughs> so what's the difference between a power ground and an RF slash lightning ground? They're two separate ground rods, for one thing. You wouldn't be doing a good job by considering your power panel ground to be a good RF ground. It's not. For one thing, it's just one ground rod. They didn't use strap. They use wire. It's just they need to be connected together because of the NEC bonding requirements. But you shouldn't depend on your power panel ground for a good RF ground or lightning ground. 
The power guys don't really care. They're not really trying to protect your house from lightning strikes when they install that ground. They're doing that because the NEC specifies it. It's more for 120 volts AC safety in the house. The AC panel is grounded at the entrance to the structure. Uh, there's usually one earth electrode. It's usually 8 or 10 feet long. And it's usually right outside of your uh, home or garage where your panel is, where your main power panel is. If you go out and take a look, and I have done this uh, because I bonded those together when I installed my ham radio system. You get, go out and take a look at the quality of the connections on your power panel ground, it's pretty atrocious. After five or ten years, that thing's going to be corroded, it's going to be barely conducting, and it's just not a good, reliable ground. Any ham person who really wants the best performance out of the station is going to install and care for his own grounds. <clears throat> the RF lightning ground, on the other hand, is implemented usually with shortest path for, with minimum impedance, and that means minimal inductance. You don't want long wires, 50 foot long, between your ham shack and ground. So you use big, wide conductors that have small inductance, and you're shooting for the shortest path, which is right outside your ham station, usually. Okay. Um, the best interconnects are wide copper straps, whereas this is just a wire, usually a number six or number four wire. This would be uh, wide copper straps. In fact, I'll show you what they look like. Uh, I brought some three-inch <coughs> copper strap from Georgia Copper. And usually people are putting this strap in. This strap is ubiquitous. Use it for connecting your ground rods as well as connecting to your single point ground panel. Uh, and it comes in two inch and three inch. Uh, two inch, there's not a huge advantage of going to three inch. Um, as you, if you look in the appendix, I show the inductance of various widths of copper strap. But um, my, my opinion is if when it comes to lightning protection, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So I put three inch in my system. The RF and lightning ground should be implemented as a single point ground. That's extremely critical. Uh, and we'll talk about that. That's, if, you, if you walk away from this presentation with any concept, any teaching in your mind, it needs to be that you understand the value of a single point ground, what's called a single point ground, and we'll explain that. Multiple ground rods are usually beneficial in an RF and lightning ground. One ground rod really is it's the minimum, and for people who are just starting out with their ham shack, that's great. The great thing about grounding is you can always expand your system. And I'll show you an easy way to do that, in fact. Um, and so as you get more time and energy and, and resources, you can expand your grounding system and make it safer and safer and safer. <clears throat> or you can be like Stu and put in a Cadillac system from the very beginning and then have to dig it all up when he has landscaping later on. <laughs> uh, we'll take a look at the new system because it's a really good teaching tool and a really good example. Um, the features that result in a good lightning ground, as I said before, also result in a good ground. Now, when we talk about grounding, one of the essential things to understand is that theoretically you don't really need a good RF ground if your antenna is perfectly balanced. And what that means is the current and the positive and the negative leg of the antenna are identical. If that's the case, the transmission line is doing everything you need the feed line from your transmitter to your antenna is doing everything you need to keep all the potentials where they need to be at, all the voltages. Unfortunately, all practical antennas have some imbalance. <coughs> and uh, it can, this imbalance can come from a, a wide variety of issues and there's actually, that's a presentation unto itself talking about antenna imbalances and so on and so forth. They gave a presentation a couple of years ago on balance and uh, if you were to go back and look at that, that would cover this in some detail. But anyway, uh, antennas can aggravate balance issues. There are certain antennas, and I'm not criticizing these antennas. They're great. Some of them are great for portable operation, like the unfed half wave. You know, probably 50% of people who are doing portable operations are using an unfed half wave. There's nothing wrong with that. But at your home, uh, these kinds of asymmetrical antennas, and they all have some type of electrical asymmetry, that's why they're not balanced, 
um, create imbalance, which creates what's called shield currents. And we'll take a look at that in a second. But these aggravate the balance issues. And the balance, an aggravated balance issue means that your grounding system needs to be better and better to be able to handle that. You could actually operate without a ground. You still need a lightning ground. You still need to bond it to the power ground. But from an RF standpoint, you could get by without it if you have a perfectly balanced dipole. Okay. There is no such thing, by the way. <laughs> dipole probably comes as close as possible to a balanced system. And particularly if you put a ballon on the feed line, then it becomes uh, quite a good balanced system. But anyway, things like NFET long wires and random wires and the kind of stuff that you do when you're new ham, you just lay a wire out and go, wow, the antenna works. That's not really a balanced system. So that produces shield, what's called shield currents. So what do we mean by shield currents? Well, electrical engineers like to break down signals into two categories on a transmission line. One is called common mode signal, and the other is called differential mode signal. Differential mode signal means the current that goes in this terminal comes back out there. And they're perfectly balanced down to the microamp. Doesn't happen in real life, but it looks good on paper in theory. A common mode signal, on the other hand, travels along the shield, and it's the same thing in both conductors. It's in the center conductor and it's in the uh, shield. Well, you'd say, okay, even basic electronics tells me I can't keep pumping current into a point in space without it blowing up. Okay? Because the current's got to get out of there. Charge keeps building up. Current is charged per second. So things keep charging up and charging up and charging up. And whatever the capacitance that thing the ground is determines its voltage. Well, that's why lightning strikes right, result in tens of kilovolts of voltage. Because you, you charge it up. So common mode currents are a problem in a ham system. Because there's no return path on your transmission line for the current. It's a sign that your transmission line is not working right. So where is that current going to come back? Well, electrical engineering tells you it's got to come back somewhere. So it's coming back through parasitic structures and miscellaneous structures, mainly the earth ground and any stru metal structures that are attached to earth ground. Okay. So <clears throat> the sum of the common mode and the differential currents, actually, you can see the common mode adds to this one. The common mode subtracts from that one. And so it basically creates an imbalance. So what's the impact of common mode currents? Well, basically, some key causes, uh, the impacts are here, but let's first talk about some causes. Imbalanced antennas are the, one of the key causes of imbalance. Another cause is interference radiating into a cable. If there's a really large transmitter and you, your ground is less than ideal, some of that transmitter come, radiates into the shield, or maybe the neighbor's computer sends out a broadband signal that's radiating into your shield uh, and raises the potential of the shield in a way that's completely unrelated to the signal you're trying to detect. So as a result, um, that can cause these currents to travel on the shield. Uh, and I don't have time right now to go into why they're on the shield. It has to do with what's called Gauss's law and electrostatic repulsion, but basically, almost all these imbalances are on the outer surface of that shield, not in the center conductor. The impacts of the common mode currents in the cable, they affect your antenna impedance, they'll warp your antenna impedance. So if you're using a VSWR meter, you can see the effects of these things. It degrades the performance of your antenna almost all the time. It can impact antenna radiation patterns because now, in a balance, common, common source of imbalance is earth. If we put a dipole up in a tree, one leg of the dipole may be, have a different capacitance to earth than the other. And so the charge splits up and the current in the two legs is different and now you have an imbalance. Um, common mode currents radiate. They turn the feed line shield into a giant antenna. That's usually not a good idea. And if they radiate, it also means they're getting radiated into. So it's, it's, it's always both ways. If your system is radiating because you have shield currents, 
It's also true that your neighbor's computer is radiating into your system. So noise issues are addressed by dealing with common mode kernels. <coughs> So the bottom line with antenna balance and RF grounds, and they're sort of in, intimately related, is that the quality of the RF ground needed is largely determined by the quality of the antenna balance. If you have a balance on a dipole, you probably don't need a really good RF ground nearly as badly as if you're doing an NFED heavy. So if possible, avoid antennas that aggravate balance issues. Try to use dipoles and try to use balance. And of course, that's the third point here. Use balance to help with antenna balance. Uh, the detrimental impact of balance we've already talked about, so I won't go over that. By the way, this, Hams call this RF in the shack. Mm -hmm. When there's shield currents, there are common mode shield currents like that, it can raise the potential. You touch, your, you touch your receiver, you might get a little tingle or shock, okay? That tells you something's wrong. If you touch a part of your ham shack system that's supposed to be grounded and you're standing on cement in your basement or whatever and you feel a little tingle, that's a warning sign, okay? Could be, it could also be a power problem as well from a, in, insufficient bonding, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a warning sign to look at something. What is T-lines? <coughs> T-lines is transmission lines, yeah. Engineers get tired of writing transmission line all the time, so we have T-lines. <laughs> quick way to talk about it. Okay, now we're going to talk about source of lightning. Um, lightning originates from cumulonimbus clouds, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but basically it typically involves electron movement from the cloud to Earth. So it's a negative current downward into Earth or a positive current up. Though there are case documented cases of positive lightning. Uh, the most common event is cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, um, and you see that up in the sky. You'll see sort of arcs from one cloud to another, or just sort of a general brightening of the sky. The, the, the lightning is really uh, created by an intense field, electric field, which ionizes channels in random sequential steps. It doesn't happen all at once. Maybe the first several hundred yards might ionize and then it stops for some reason. These are random processes, to, it's sort of like balancing a giant ball on a pin. It's basically an unstable system, lightning, and, it, and it's trying to discharge to the earth, but it runs into blockages once in a while, then it starts to build up more and more charge, higher and higher voltage, and it ionizes the next step, and they, they call these step leaders. The very end of the lightning is called a step leader. <coughs> it, when, it, when it ionizes, it generates a plasma. And a plasma is basically taking a gas, whacking every electron out of every atom in the air, the oxygen, the nitrogen, and everything else, and creating a whole flood of charge carriers that are molten. And that's how it works. Mm -hmm. So large current discharges occur in several repetitive strokes. <clears throat> now, this has got a lot of things on here. I just wanted to show you one thing. Uh, the average peak current of a lightning strike is 25,000 amps. Even if your ground is 10 ohms or 5 ohms, which is a pretty low resistance, that's a huge voltage, okay? And it's even bigger because of inductance, <coughs> which we'll talk about shortly. The blast energy of a, of a typical lightning strike is equivalent to 200 pounds of TMT. It's a lot of power. <coughs> So this shows uh, the last lightning step leader can be attracted by features more than 150 feet above terrain level. The, the man discovered this quite a long time ago, which is why farmers and ranchers use lightning rods. But basically, if you get some sort of mast, it doesn't have to have an antenna on it, up to about 150 feet, it creates a zone of protection where the probability of a strike in roughly this area here about 150 foot radius this way and 150 foot radius this way if it's 150 foot tall. This is called the zone of protection because the most probable event is the lightning is going to strike right here. Particularly if it's a pointy object. Pointy objects intensify the field in space, the electric field, and that's where it arcs. So <clears throat> this is a misnomer. I wouldn't want to stand in this area, okay? <laughs> Warning, do not stand in the zone of protection. 
<laughs> they call it that, but it's not. It's this would be a stupid thing to do. <laughs> Stand there, <laughs> lightning <laughs> God. For one thing, when that twenty thousand amps or fifty thousand amps or whatever comes down in the ground, your feet are going to rise up to potentials of 10, 20 kilovolts. Okay. So if you're touching something else, or if you're even if your feet are just spaced slightly, and the current happens to be traveling this way and causes a voltage drop, it'll kill you. So you don't want to stand in the zone of protection. They really ought to call it something different. <laughs> this is an example of how powerful lightning is, and um, you can see that. That what this basically says is percentage of strikes with characteristics exceeding those limit. So 90% of strikes have at least this much power in terms of uh, current capability. 50% of strikes have this, 10% have that. So if we just take a look at the 50% thing, the, the rate of change of the current is measured in kiloamps per microsecond. That's really fast. It's one of the fastest electrical <coughs> phenomena in the world. It probably approaches the processes that happen during a nuclear explosion. That also happens very, very quickly in nanoseconds. And so as a result, uh, you have huge power being dumped in an extremely short period of time. Um, the single stroke is typically in the area of the millisecond range, and you usually have several strokes, and they might be separated by 30 to 40 milliseconds. And the rise time, which determines the bandwidth of this thing, is in the one to four microsecond range. So that spread that sprays the spectrum with garbage, and that's why when there's a lightning strike miles away, you hear it in your radio system. It's just putting out a flat spectrum. And it doesn't matter what channel you're on, what frequency you're tuned to, that pulse comes in, it rings all the circuitry in your radio, and you hear it as static. The IEEE likes to model things, and I'm not going to go into detail with this, but I wanted to show you that uh, they have something called an 820 model. And this is sort of the average, the typical, everyday lightning strike. Okay, and what I've done is I've shown that here, the, the model of the IEEE 820 model. And you can use this with simulation software to figure out what potential does your structure go to. The military does this all the time. The military is, is the vanguard of lightning protection. You can see why. You have radar antennas, you have very sensitive spread spectrum communications that detect nanovolts and microvolts. And so as a result, lightning is very critical to the military, and they, they have been the experts historically in this area. Anyway, you can see your typical lightning strike will pop up to about 18 kiloamps over a very short period of time, just over the tens of microsecond time, and then it sort of decays. It can get up to over 200 kiloamps, depending on the event. So, what kind of phenomena can lightning create in our yard? Okay. Well, we have the number one most common event is it strikes the utilities, strikes the power lines, because they're just a giant antenna spread over hundreds of miles. And although you're probably not going to sense a lightning strike from a couple hundred miles away because of all the repetitive grounding that, that creates voltage dividers in the system, you will see it from several miles away for sure. The second most common event is it strikes near your house, either the ground or it strikes nearby equipment. The third most common event is it strikes a nearby object, like a tree. I would have actually thought this was more common, but apparently striking Striking equipment around your house, grounded equipment or whatever, is, is more common. Finally, a direct strike to your structure, and, and very few grounding systems that, can, that are creatable by ham are going to protect against a direct lightning strike. So I'm not trying. I'm not trying to tell you that you can protect against a direct lightning strike. You need to fear for your life if you get a direct lightning strike directly on your house, on something in your house. I can attest it will start a fire about half the time. I put out. I ran on a dozen of them for yeah. 10 years. Yeah, very, very hard to protect against. Okay, this is some mathematics. I'm not going to go into details, but 
This shows why you need a very short path to your ground. Okay? Let's take the typical lightning strike from the IEEE 8-20 model and calculate the induced voltage drop due to two effects. One is the re DC resistance of the ground, which you can measure. Okay, well, it's, it's a little tricky to measure. You have to use algorithms and measure between two ground rods, but you can measure, okay? Um, but it also calculates the inductive drop due to the very fast rate of change of the current. And uh, the voltage in an inductor is di dt, the rate of change of current in, in uh, amps per second. And it's related to the inductance, which is why we like to keep the inductance low. Anyway, this illustrates the resistance. This is a 10 ohm system. The resistance for a 10 ohm system only creates 178 volts. That's a lot. I wouldn't want to be touching anything when that ground rod goes up to 178 volts. This is, by the way, uh, for a typical system, a single ground rod. The inductance transient is 46.6 kiloamps. So the inductance is everything in lightning protection. DC resistance really doesn't make a bit of difference. So how do these ground rods work? Well, this shows you, here's the ground rod in the center. This is a top-down view. And then this is a side view showing the ground rod going into the ground. To first order, you basically get a radius of equipotential lines. So basically, uh, what happens is this thing goes up into the tens of kilovolt voltage level at the ground rod. You don't want to be touching that during a strike in your yard. And then as you get away from the ground rod, it sort of dissipates. The voltage goes down. Okay, so it might be 20 kilovolts here, it might be 10 kilovolts here, it might be 5 kilovolts, but it decays away from the ground. <clears throat> and what happens is the ground completely saturates, much like we talked about ionizing the air. Every single atom in the ground is also being ionized, and that actually helps the conduction process. They call that saturation. So the saturated lowering of its resistivity. It's due to internal arcing in the ground. So an optimal rod placement spacing, and there is a teaching to this slide, because this is a little boring, but basically, how far apart do you want to stick your rods? Two rod lengths is the spacing to avoid overlapping of the saturated region, yeah. the regions. Because if, unless, if you go to four rod lengths, it's sort of like two independent ground rods, and you get the benefit of two independent ground rods. But you don't want them too far apart if you're trying to place them periodically along your, your strap, okay? You're running your strap, strap in the ground. So optimal rod placement is about two rod lengths. For an eight foot ground rod, that's 16 feet. <clears throat> Here's a voltage drop example for a typical ground rod during a strike, okay? Um, taking the inductance of the ground rod and so on and so forth into account and also taking the resistivity of the earth into account, um, you can get about 180 kilovolts out of that, okay? In fact, you see how these voltages de decaying? You don't want to be standing within 10 or 20 feet of that ground rod because the voltage from this foot to this foot is enough to kill you. That's how people die from lightning. So there's a huge voltage gradient at the same of the ground rod. So how do we deal with this? Um, how could you possibly deal with these huge voltages? Your radio isn't intended to deal with 20 kilo kilovolts or 10 kilovolts. It's just not, it's not intended to deal with that. There is no easy way to achieve large voltage re reductions in the ground system except in very expensive military installations. In military installations, they put wire and strap into giant concrete embankments. And it turns out, you wouldn't think this, I was surprised to find this out when I first started investigating this. After concrete sits in the ground for a while, it absorbs moisture, becomes an excellent dissipator of lightning energy. And so most military ground systems are giant encasements of concrete underground with ground wires running into them. <laughs> Well, to make our ham station survive, we take a cue from the birds. If you look at high tension uh, power lines, they have tens of kilovolts on them. Birds can sit up there right next to each other, no problem, right? They don't die. Why is that? 
It's because they don't know where ground is. <laughs> if one bird leg was on the line and the other bird leg was spanned all the way to the ground, they'd be fried. They'd be completely vaporized. So this is the concept of floating the system. They're only on one terminal of the problem, not on both terminals. Okay? Which is why electricians have the rule that they put their, if they're working on an energized circuit, they always take one hand and they put it behind themselves in their pocket. Good rule of thumb. Then they very rarely can they get electrocuted that way. So we can use the same technique. And this is called a single point ground system. We allow that ground. There's nothing we can do about keeping, during a lightning strike, keeping that ground from rising up to 10 or 20 kilovolts. Not a thing we can do. You can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's still going to happen. Okay, <coughs> except maybe in a really expensive military system. And they spend millions to billions on that to protect a radar installation. So <clears throat> for this to work, the potential of absolutely all wires and interconnects to the ham station must be related to this single point ground. So now, if this is our single point ground and this is the various connections to it, and it's a conductor, it's a flat panel, okay, and we'll show some examples in a second in pictures, but when the lightning strikes, it goes from zero volts all the way up, and every piece of equipment in your ham shack ideally floats with it and also goes up to 20 kilovolts. But the potential difference between the equipment is zero, or very, very low. And that's how you protect a ham shack, or any installation, even a military installation, from lightning damage. You create a ground that can float up and down because it only has one ground connection to Earth. Okay? As far as your ham shack is concerned. In other words, all your ham equipment grounds go back to that panel. And I'll show you how we do that. <clears throat> As may not be immediately obvious. Okay, so this illustrates the ideal single point ground system. Here's a ham shack maybe in the corner of the house. Um, and we have this single point ground, which is the green panel. And power comes in there, telephone comes in there, data comes in there, cable comes in there, all antenna lines come in there and are grounded right to that one panel. This is an ideal system. Most hams can't implement this. <clears throat> because the ham shack and the power panel are usually in different locations. I, I mean, I want my ham shack out in my cold garage. I want to be warm <laughs> when I'm operating my radio. So by definition, hams like to have things separated. But this is the ideal. If you could build the ideal system, this would be it. The other artifact of the ideal system is it's a strapped array of ground rods that completely surrounds the house. And this is get, gets back to what we call Goss's Law. If you can set the potential around this entire house like this, the whole house will float up and down from 0 to 20 kilovolts. But if you're inside it and everything is at 20 kilovolts, you don't know it. You won't know that. Unless you have another connection that goes out to Earth way over here or something. Then you'll kill yourself. So everything has to be referenced to this one panel. So the ideal system, this is summarizes what we just talked about. All power, telephone, cable, data, antennas all enter a house near the same point. That's the ideal system. We'll talk about how how to deal with it when you don't have an ideal system, but that's the ideal system. And all these utility grounds and antenna collect shields use the same single point ground. And they're all surge suppressed on that ground panel. Surge suppressors have huge amounts of current flowing through them when they are tripped. You want to make sure that current also goes to that ground. So all the house and its contents will just simply float up and down with the unavoidable consequences of this lightning strike. And the surge suppressors clamp the center conductors and various utility hot signals to a small voltage above the single point ground. Usually it's in the 100 volts or less range for uh, MOV devices. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about some configurations here. Um, 
this, uh, this underscores the importance of bonding. The NEC requires that if you have a ham shack ground system, say one rod or five rods or whatever it is, it needs to be bonded to the power drop. I'm going to move over here. I don't know why I like to be on the left, but um, <laughs> if you look at the rules of presentation, they tell all presenters to stand on the left. Um, and if I stand on the right, my wife gets down on my case. So I'll come over for a while. Uh, let's say this is, this is our amateur radio station. Here's our amateur radio station ground. Here's a typical DC resistance for the grounding system to earth. And we haven't bonded. We haven't bonded this ground to this ground. Okay, so what would happen? What, what, are, what are the consequences of that? Well, here's, this is your power panel, basically. You got a fuse in your power panel or a circuit breaker, 15 amps is typical. Very low resistance, because these are pretty big wires, 12 gauge wires or whatever. Um, let's say there's a fault between the power line and your amateur radio station. Either caused because your amateur radio station is plugged in to the wall and therefore makes connection to that during a fault, right? This is why chassis, in the old days, chassis, all chassis used to be grounded. Everything was built out of metal. We're too cheap anymore to do that. The world can't afford to build everything out of metal. That's why everything is plastic, and that's why wall warts abound. By the way, what, why are wall warts so ubiquitous? Does anyone know? It's because of grounding. They, the manufacturer does not have to supply a third pin ground. That's expensive. It costs them money. So they float their system. They use transformers in those wall warts, and they completely isolate ground from the equipment. And that's why there's wall warts everywhere in the world now. So <clears throat> let's say a fault happens. Well, 15 amps of current is going to flow before that burns out, before that fuse blows. But if you, if you don't bond, you could get shocked. In fact, you might not even know about it until you touch it and get whacked and, and you're lying on the floor. Okay? If you bond the system with a low conductor, a, a low <coughs> resistance wire, then what will happen is that fault will get to the, the uh, radio station chassis or the, the receiver chassis, conduct over here and complete the path and it forces the fuse to blow. It takes the system out. That's, that, this is one of the main reasons you have a safety ground in a power system. But to achieve that result, you have to bind things together. So a fault is what? Like a, a fault is, is shorting your this is the hot lead. I haven't shown all three connectors. Mm -hmm. This is the green. The neutral is also here. That's the white wire. But this is the red wire or the black wire in your power system. And let's say that accidentally touches your chassis. This happens all the time. Thousands of people have been killed because of this fault in, in years past. Um, <coughs> stuff happens. I mean, it's just, that's what happens. So you have to have backup, safety backups. And this bonding is what <coughs> takes care of that. Because it causes a fuse to blow so you can figure out you have a problem. You're going to tell us how to bond that? How yeah, I'll show some. We're, get, we're, we're getting the configuration. And that, that's thousands of people with refrigerators, stoves, toasters, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Not remember old radio. toaster? I mean, people have been killed by to toaster. is like yeah. the classic kill case for fault appliances, right? Because <coughs> mm -hmm. you got a bunch of hot lead wires in there causing your, your, uh, your wires to glow. And if one of those wires breaks and then happens to touch the chassis, you might have a 10 or 20 ohm resistance to that. Well, 10 or 20 ohms at 120 volts is enough to kill you. It only takes 50 milliamps or so to kill you. So it's not much. Okay, and what this series of configurations is hopefully going to teach is we're going to start with the simplest thing and work our way up in terms of grounding sophistication. And we're going to analyze what kind of faults can happen and what's wrong with it. Okay, and there's about four of these on their show. So this system has bonding. Okay, we run a wire on the outside of our home. 
and, and I'll describe why this actually describes why you want it on the outside of your home and not the inside of your home. You could say, well, the system is bonded from the mains wiring. And that's sort of true. But you don't want, if a lightning strike happens out here and this ground carries humongous amounts of current, you don't want your house wiring carrying 20 kiloamps. Okay, it's going to burn everything up. If you put this in the ground, then it can handle that much better. It can be a bigger wire, you don't have to deal with it, so on and so forth, particularly if it's a copper strap. So this is better because it's bonded, but there's still weaknesses. The house wiring forms a parallel path, so the current will divide from this leg and this leg because of, at the same potential, at least at, at, uh, at the service entrance. So there's still quite a bit of current flowing through the house that's undesired and it's ground, and that's the green wire in your house system. Um, there's no surge suppression on the ham shaft either. So the ham sh if lightning strikes, the, ha the lightning burst, can its currents can follow its way and current divide between these two paths. But if a current divides in this path, that means that your whole ham sh shaft goes up in potential. So this is, not, this is better, but not a great system. Um, this illustrates another problem. The ham is properly bonded to the system and powers the shaft off a house wall outlet, but then he puts a surge suppressor inside. You know, you've seen these little surge suppressors you can plug directly into the outlet or whatever. Here's one of the problems with these things. If the MOV devices that cause the surge protection, that's called metal oxide varistor, it has a property that if the voltage gets too high, it internally arcs over and conducts. Okay. Well, it'll conduct if it, it's if it's configured this way to the power, to the house's power ground. What happens is in a lightning strike or some sort of transient current flows through here. And there's an inductance in here. This might be 15 feet of line cord or 10 feet of line cord. That has microhenries of inductance. That 20 kiloamps per second DIDT we're talking about across five microhenries is a whopping big voltage. And so what will happen is the MOVs in the surge suppressor will trigger, but it's going to raise the potential of all your equipment because it doesn't have a low impedance, low inductance path to ground. Okay. So this point needs to be returned back to your single point ground, not some internal point that's dependent on a line cord to connect to the green wire in your power system. Okay, here's a good configuration for sep what's called separated power and, and single point ground scenarios. Um, the single point ground is bonded to the power entry. The shack power is now surge suppressed. The surge suppressor is grounded to the single point ground panel. That's the problem we just saw in the last example with an internal surge suppressor. You don't want surge suppressors in here plugged into the wall. You don't just avoid those. You want all your surge suppressors right here on the panel. So they're, they're referenced to single point ground. The connection from surge suppressor to single point ground should be very low impedance. Uh, we'll discuss ways to get that done. And this is most easily done if the suppressor has a ground plane. So almost all entry panels are basically some type of plane. Big flat chunk of copper on which you mount things. So here's a practical problem. We said the ideal scenario was power, data, cable TV, all that stuff, telephone, <coughs> coax antennas all that stuff, coax, coax transmission lines for antennas, comes in through the single point ground. Well, that's not real easy to implement because we don't necessarily want our ham shack in the garage where our power, many power panels are located, or down in the basement, or wherever it is. <clears throat> so the options you have are to use a relatively long bonding connection with single point ground reference power surge suppression in the shack, as in this prior example. Or you can place the single point ground and the antenna entry at a power utility entry point and use a perimeter ground system. This is Stu's system, which we'll look at in a second. 
Or you can bring the power panel to the single point ground. This is a trick. This is actually what I do in my system via the installation of electrical subpanel. I don't actually have a physical subpanel in my ham shack entry panel, but I do have a small multi-outlet extension of the power panel that travels underground right next to the to the uh, circular ground wire uh, strap system and all the ground rods and basically brings the power panel to my entry panel. And this is one of the best ways to do this. This is not my idea, by the way. I studied numerous polyphasor aptitudes. And if you want to put yourself to sleep at night, that's the thing to do. <laughs> polyphasor is the world's expert on this stuff. There's no question about it. Um, they make excellent products. Uh, they actually recommend bringing, uh, putting an electrical subpanel in at the, at the uh, single point ground location. You don't have to quite do that. And this is what I actually do. I, I use a variance approach, and that in, implements an external feeder line dedicated to the ham shaft. So I don't have to connect any ham radio equipment into any outlets in my house. They only connect to outlets on my single point ground, which is an extension of my power panel. Hmm. And in my case, this ground rod strap is in the same trench with this uh, power feeder line. So it also doesn't create ground loops. Putting everything in the same trench, you know, you hear about ground loop problems. And the whole issue with ground loop problems, if you, unless you study electrical engineering, it may seem a little mystic. Loops with magnetic flux, fluxing through them, that's varying at very fast rates, creates induced EMFs in that loop. Even though the loop looks short at a DC, at AC it's not. And so ground loop problems, ground loops are antennas. They're parasitic antennas. And that's why people try to avoid them. So this approach actually minimizes that effect. So here's an example of Stu Turner's system. Um, and this is a great system. It's a good example. And Stu was nice enough five years ago to, to uh, actually make this view graph up for me after mapping the system out. But basically, Stu also believes in if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. <laughs> I don't know how many ground rods he's got in here, probably this many. Completely going around his house, his whole house will float up and down on that single point ground and it forms basically a Gaussian surface around the house, so everything in the house will be at the same potential. It's a really good system. This is expensive to do though, right? Most hams don't do that. I don't do that. Um, but anyway, his power panel, this is a little key here. Here's his shack. It's separated from the power panel, but he has his antennas come in right near his power panel. So he can get a very short bond between them, which is good. And then he routes uh, his conductors and his grounds out to his, uh, or his coax lines over to here. And he has attaches with a very short connection to his ground ring. And the advantage of a ground ring is it's a really good ground everywhere. Okay? It's, it's, it doesn't get any better than this. But it takes a lot of rods and a lot of driving. He actually drove all these by hand. Um, I use, I rented a, a small jackhammer. And man, that's the way to go. It'll drive a ground rod in 30 seconds. In fact, it's such an impressive tool, I went out and actually bought one. <laughs> you can get a shovel attachment, and I'll tell you, when you're digging in Colorado soil, so you put this little thing down, and you turn it on, it's all ready to China within five seconds. <laughs> so it's a fabulous tool. But uh, he's got two inch copper strap going all the way around here. He's, he calls them lightning tubes. He uses polyphaser surge arresters, I think. And uh, he's got his copper entry panel here, which is very, very close to his power panel. So he gets a very good connection and bonding that way. And then this is his house electrical ground here. So this is one way of solving the problem of having a ham shack separate from your power panel. Here's an example of a picture of Stu's system from the outside. Okay. Here's two inch strap and two inch strap taking this grounded plane down into earth ground and then this goes down into his ground, ground ring 
of multiple ground rods. He's also got ground rods right here, by the way. The most important ground rods in your entire system are the ones that are just one or two feet away from your panel because they're going to take the brunt of the force, transient force from the lightning. By the way, it is a force. So much current flows, huge magnetic fields are created. You can't just solder these connections together. You can't just easily bolt them together. They have to be really solidified. So you use some big stainless steel bolts for all these attachments. Because when those 20 kiloamps flow through from a lightning strike, there's huge repulsive forces from the magnetic field trying to blow this system apart. Mm. A good lightning ground system has to be mechanically robust. Mm. You need to be able to take a hammer to it and not <clears throat> destroy it. Here's the interior of Stu's system. Here's this uh, polyphaser, I think those are polyphaser uh, lightning arresters. And so it's very, very short chassis, just a couple of inches. Um, and polyphaser, they don't just use MOVs. They use much faster responding things that, that respond within a nanosecond or so. So they're very, very effective. They're also very expensive. They're like 70 or 80 bucks a piece. Anyway, this is, on, this is from the inside of his garage near his polyphaser. <coughs> and then here's his ham shack in a different part of the house. It's still connected to a single point ground because now a single point ground goes all the way around the house. That's what allows them to do this and be safe. If a single point ground didn't go all the way around the house, he couldn't do this. Because you can't have a 30 or 40 foot long ground wire. The inductance is way too much. It does no good. Okay. One of the questions that uh, Larry asked is what do we do with attic antennas? First off, the NEC has no rule Attic antenna is really far away from everything, right? NEC has no rule about grounding attic antennas. It's a, considered an indoor antenna, just like your rabbit ears in the old days, in the 50s. You don't have to ground it. You don't have to bond that down to earth. Um, because being under the roof creates sort of a protective zone, lightning has to ionize the air, then it has to, there's a discontinuity of wood there, it has to ionize its way through that. And it just turns out because of the physics of things that your roof does a pretty good job of protecting you from, a, from lightning coming in through the wood and hitting your antenna. Mm -hmm. So there's no requirement for that. And lots of hams have ungrounded attic antennas. So attic antenna is pretty good. Okay. Right. A more difficult problem is a ham shack that's on a second floor. That's sort of a major problem because you can't possibly be close to your single point ground. It's 20, 30 feet away to get to earth. That's a problem. But an attic <coughs> antenna going to a ham shack in your basement is fine. Mike? You're talking about going through the wood like the plywood where you nail your shingles on? Yeah. <coughs> what if you have a metal roof? Does that affect it in any way? <coughs> I'm thinking uh, that the NEC requires metal roofs. A metal roof is a metal structure sticking up into the air. And the NEC says all metal structures sticking up in the air need to be grounded. So I'm going to guess, I don't know this for sure because I don't, I've never had a metal roof, but I'm going to guess that a metal roof has an NEC requirement to be pretty well grounded. Is it a residential metal roof or is it a metal roof like on a lawn? Single family lawn. You but should have plywood underneath the metal. Yeah, those on the roof, yeah. Yeah. But Instead of having asphalt shingles, it has metal yeah. sheets. Yeah, but those signals going to get out of that. Yeah, the wood is still an intervening barrier. Yeah, it has to be separately ionized, and those kinds of ionizer, ionization discontinuities really help protect things. Um, and much like a lightning strike on your car protects you because it's a Gaussian, it's a complete Gaussian surface around you. If I could. Uh, go back into the zone of protection for, for an example and take a direct lightning strike on a, on a 10 foot metal sphere that I'm sitting in that completely covers me, it wouldn't kill me. My whole body would float up to 20 or 30 kilovolts or 200 kilovolts or whatever, but there's no potential difference because it completely shields. Okay, does that make sense? It's like the single point ground. If you could embed your body and a completely metal sphere that's a conductor, like a copper sphere, it would protect you from lightning, direct lightning strike, just like 
a car does a really good job of that. The schools teach that you should be getting out of your car if there's lightning any place close. Yeah. Then you shouldn't stay in the car. Yeah, because a but car has breaches. It's not a perfect, uh, it, it doesn't completely cover all the space around you. There's, there's intervening paths to get in that are not shielded. And that's why, I mean, you don't want to take things to the limit in a car. I, yeah. I agree, you want to get out of the storm if you can. But the fact that it's... They're just saying get out of the car. Yeah, the fact that it's sitting on on rubber tires and that creates a six-inch, uh, you know, rubber's a barrier to ionization, and then your the, the distance between ground and your and your uh, wheels, oh, yeah. metal wheels, yeah. all that stuff helps provide a little bit of protection. Um, we're getting close to finishing here. This is my system. Uh, <clears throat> My ham shack is down in the basement, and I actually have an outdoor panel made by uh, a really good ham company in Utah. Um, it has a door, it opens up, and I fit everything in that panel. But it's basically similar to, to Stu's planer system. It's basically a giant pl copper plane in there. And um, I don't have a, a grounding system that goes all the way around the house. I do have several rods. I'll show you a picture of this ground wall, in fact, uh, so you get an idea. Here's my power panel. Okay, so I'm bonded to the power panel. Everything runs underground. See this red line? That's an underground power line feeder that I installed when I dug that trench. <coughs> um, and so all my power from my ham shack comes in, right in through the single point ground. Um, I have a very long wire going out to a ground rod at the base of my dipole tree. I have a, you know, I have a hard 20 foot dipole strapped between several trees, which took man weeks to install. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's not, this is too long of a run to worry about using strap. It's going to have way too much inductance. But the NEC requires that if you have an antenna or any sort of metal thing up in the air, it's got to be grounded. So you got to bring a ground wire down that tree and put a ground rod right there, which is what that is. Uh, let's see, any other issues? All my ground rods, I'll show you this, all my ground rods are in what's called Erico, Erico ground wells. It's a plastic, it looks like a smaller version of a Home Depot orange bucket. And you dig a hole in the ground, you fill the bottom up with pea gravel, you pound your ground rod in through the pea gravel, and then wire things up. And what it does is it keeps all the water, it drains, the pea gravel drains into the earth. It keeps all the water, all the soil, all the garbage away from your precious ground rod connection, which you're trying to keep pristine, okay? Uh, and I'll show a picture of those. These, these ground, ground wells allow you to maintenance and actually check your grounds periodically, which is a good thing to do. You go burying something in the ground, you forget where it's at. In a couple of years, it's going to need maintenance, maybe need to clean it off, get corrosion off of it or whatever. If you have a ground well, it's a real simple process, as you'll see. I'll show you a picture. If you don't have ground wells, you're just making a lot of work for yourself. So even though it's more cost to install these ground wells, it's, in my opinion, it's worthwhile if you're going to have more than one ground rod and you want to keep it pristine. By the way, uh, is it shift tam to go backwards? That didn't work. Hmm. You just the left arrow. Left arrow. All right. Page it's up, not shift tab. Anyone know how to go backwards? Left arrow. Left arrow. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. I'm an analog guy. <laughs> I'm about 0.5 questions deep in digital. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is a really busy thing. But basically, if you have a tower, if you're, if you're rich enough to be able to put a tower in and have these giant Yagi, Yagi antennas on top of it and stuff like that, that's great. Uh, but it's a big chunk of metal sticking up into the sky, and the NEC requires it to be grounded. Um, 
And so you, you have a very extensive grounding system here. In fact, the tower goes down to a concrete base, which keeps it from blowing over in the wind. That concrete base has ground wires running through it, much like a military system, and that's how you protect your tower. Because this is going to take strikes sooner or later. And then you have, here's your coax coming into your single point ground here, and then you bond. Remember, everything needs to be bonded. You can't have ground rods sticking into the ground on your property without connecting them all together. So here's the bonding connection. And here it's showing the perimeter ground. This is sort of an ideal system. Just a quick summary of grounding at the antenna. Uh, antenna support structure philosophy, you're going to see all sorts of opinions on how to ground things and some of them are going to be wrong. There's no topic in ham radio that's more full of garbage opinions <laughs> and ill-informed opinions than grounding. Okay, So you've got to be careful. But, and a lot of people will say all support structures need to be metal. Well, here's an expert in ham radio, Steve Morris, great guy. He's written a book called uh, Up the Tower. It's a fabulous book, by the way, uh, on a lot of fronts, particularly waterproofing connections. He's, this guy's just a font of information. But anyway, um, he says, go ahead and use what you have. You just have to ground the antennas, just like I do with my dipole. I run a wire down that tree and ground it uh, in the ground. Most experts seem to agree on the following, though, for, for uh, grounding antennas. Coax should be attached to ground conductors at the top <coughs> and bottom of the structure, with our, which are earth grounded at the base. A metal mass lighting rod should, should protrude above all antennas by several feet to help route lightning strikes to the, de to the grounding system and not your antennas. So you stick something up higher it's basically a lightning rod, much like you find on ranches and farms, above your antennas. That helps, believe it or not. And then all antenna earth grounding networks should be connected to a single point ground, despite the long distances involved. You can see from that diagram, you're not going to put a tower right next to your house. It could be 100 feet away. That's not a problem, but it's got to go through the single point ground. Mike, have you uh, went into the cat weld? Uh, bonding system. Yeah, and that's in the appendix. I won't get to that. Okay. Uh, in terms of, if you want me to discuss it briefly, I can. I can go to the slide. It's, it's another way of, yep. it lets you bury the top of the ground rod and have a... Yeah, what he's talking bad. about, Erico, the company Erico makes several useful grounding things. They make these little kits. Oh, that's and that's I don't know what chemical is in there, but it, it, you, you, uh, you light it. And it fizzes and sparks and creates giant, a bright white flash, <laughs> and it yeah, and it and it welds itself all in one shot. You don't even have to know welding or brazing or anything like that. The problem is those Erico, um, and they have a name for them. I forget what they're called. So those Erico uh, thermite thermite yeah thermite things are only available in certain very limited connections, like connecting one ground wire to yeah. another. I could not find anything made by Erico to connect the straps to ground rods. Uh, you don't want to run ground wires if you can avoid it. Use strap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. CAD weld. Well, CAD weld, well, that's what they call yeah. Yeah. Exothermic. Exothermic, yeah. yeah. Is, is the strap it looks cool. They need to expand the line and make something that's actually Basically, useful. Basically, it has a ceramic pot that goes around the top of the ground rod, right. and you bring the wire into it, and it fills the entire thing with melted copper. Yeah, it just wells the whole thing, <laughs> all in a matter of seconds. Yeah. you got to let it cool for a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is the strap mostly an RF ground concern, or is it a lighting protection concern? <coughs> Both, yeah. Uh, both, and I, I will discuss, I'm going to touch one slide in the appendix to, that addresses that point because it is very important. I think I just did, went too far again. Okay, so we're now in the appendix, and I'm going to skip through some of this. Feel free to read through it on your own. Uh, I'll just give you a quick tour. Uh, I talk about ground rod characteristics, the influence of the resistance on depth, the ther theoretical resistance resistance change by adding ground rods. There's, 
Like in everything in science, there's always a point of diminishing returns. Putting in 200 ground rods doesn't make any sense. Okay. This chart will show you how many ground rods for how much money is worthwhile. Um, here's some facts about ground rods. I just use Home Depot ground rods. Five eighths is a good diameter. I wouldn't use half inch. There are less money at half inch. But when you're trying to pound those in through rock, by the way, that Makita tool, that, it's, it's, like a, uh, it's like one of the lightest weight jackhammers you can get, basically. That thing will go brrrr, and then it'll sit there for a few seconds, and I know it hit a rock. And I'll just let it work on it, and a few seconds later, it goes brrrr, right through the rock. Okay. <laughs> Stu spent days counting what ground rock. I don't know if he hit a boulder underground or what, but... <laughs> It's quite a story. So <laughs> <laughs> represented that tool in the presentation. Yeah. Right. yeah, and if it's not in here, uh, give me a call and I'll tell you exactly what it is because yeah. I have one in my garage. Okay. It's one of my favorite tools besides my tractor. Do you ready? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyone who wants to drive ground rods is welcome to use my uh, my little mini jack hammer. Would you donate it to the <laughs> <laughs> no. There's no way I'm, I'm giving that thing up because I actually dig with it too. It's a very rapid way. If you need to rent it, you'll make money. Um, <laughs> uh, you can do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm, anyone in the club is willing to borrow it um, if they need if they need to drive some ground rods. If you only have one ground rod, it's probably not worth it. But if you're going to do three or more, by all means, call me up and borrow my little jet can. T-post drivers actually work pretty well too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the right tool makes a big difference. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> After 50 foot length, the string of rods and straps has dissipated the majority of the lightning strike. So, all the action is with the rod. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a, a plane would. Okay, so almost all the action is at the edges of your strap, conducting that lightning energy into the ground. <clears throat> um, here's the thing Chip was talking about, the Erico Cad well. Um, I use physical clamps with antioxidant compound. Um, people are welcome to come up and take a look at this. this for new hands, this is one of the most confusing things. This stuff is basically petroleum jelly impregnated with a pile of copper. And it's a lot of copper. In fact, if you put some out on your hand, it's basically, even the petroleum jelly is not all that conductive. But impregnated with copper, like this stuff is, makes a great connection. The advantage of the jelly, and I don't know for a fact it's petroleum jelly, but it sort of feels like that. It protects your joint from corrosion for long periods of time, years. So you never want to make a press fit or a clamp type fit without this stuff. And there's two types. There is the antioxidant for copper, <coughs> copper to copper, and copper to stainless steel. So they have similar, uh, what's the word for that? The electropotential between dissimilar materials. I forget right now. Uh, anyway, you, you can't just attach copper to anything because you'll get this reaction over time, particularly if there's moisture, and it'll corrode. This stuff will keep a press fit contact like a uh, there's clamps you can buy that are all copper that clamp the strap and then they clamp the ground rod at the same time. And you want to sand the copper on every surface, get it pristine so you can see your, your face in it, and then spread it on this stuff. And if you can't assemble it right way, this stuff will keep it from corroding for up to months later. Where do you find it? Um, that company from Utah sells it. Almost every ham radio company sells this. It's called antioxidant. <laughs> and there's a copper to copper and copper to stainless steel. That's this stuff. Because stainless steel has a similar electro electrical potential, electro potential to uh, copper. And then there's this, uh, this is a different brand made by Burndy. It's called Penetrox A. And it's designed for making aluminum to aluminum and aluminum to copper connections. So if you buy the, and in any ham station, you're always, that a lot of people like, like uh, uh, polyphaser, they're often using aluminum shells for their lightning arresters. So having to bond aluminum, copper, and stainless steel together can all be handled by buying yourself both types of this. You don't need copper to copper, or copper to steel are not too bad. Copper to aluminum makes a battery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that is the effect. That, that current flow causes degradation. Um, the yes. site in Utah is at kf700.com. Is that the one? Yeah. It's a, there's a KF and a 7. KF7. KF7. Yeah. It's a fabulous place. I bought all sorts of stuff from that KF7Z guy. Metal works. I love that guy. He gives very personalized service. So he made your panel and everything. Yeah, in fact, I show his uh, name in here later. Uh, I'm going to end here. Uh, here's thing on driving ground rods. Here's yeah, there some your, comments yeah. on surge suppressors. I don't have time to cover this, but you can take a look at that. Um, here's components and assembly. Where to get grounding components uh, tells you that. Georgia Copper is a really good bulk place to get copper in quantity. Um, here's the ground law I was telling you about. This is with the lid on. <clears throat> and if I loosen that hex bolt and it's spring loaded, it just pops up. And then I these are for rotating. You can put your fingers in there and rotate this by about 30 degrees, and that lid comes off. And now you see what's inside. And this was probably dug to a depth of about a foot and a half, and then six inches of pea gravel in here. Here's my ground rod, and here's that connection with this stuff on every joint, metal to metal joint. So that well doesn't go the whole length of the rod. Notice it's sticking above ground. This mm -hmm. pea gravel drains, keeps it nice and dry in there. You don't have dust, dirt, rodents, whatever, getting in there and, and, and degrading your ground pollution. This is a fabulous way to go. These aren't cheap, but you know what? I think they're worth it.
So I don't want to have to dig up ground rods in five years. Doesn't four that rounds. reduce the contact that part that's in the gravel? Yeah, but yeah. this is eight foot long. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Pea gravel is not a great conductor, but it's only it's only about six inches of pea gravel. Cool. Out of eight foot, that's nothing. So what is it cr critical for you to inspect? Is the connection? The connection. Yeah. You take a look You're at not it. You're going to be able to inspect that whole eight foot length. This connection will last way longer than one that's sitting in earth and, and subject to moisture and bugs and I mean just you know, everything rots in the ground. So to answer the question, what he's inspecting is the ground strap to the ground rod connection. Yeah. The connection. The connection. Mm -hmm. okay. And your so copper strap is just uninsulated, it's just in contact with the ground the whole Yeah, and bit. that's beneficial. Contact with the ground, that's that effect I was talking about. It's way better than wire. Huge surface area, sharp edges, and electromagnetic transmission lines loss due to the earth contact serving as a dielectric, a conductive dielectric for the strip. Well, that's all the deeper those straps have to be around your house? About three inches underground or what? Um, yeah, I get them down far enough that if I'm casually digging, I'm not going to hit them. But yeah, I put them about a foot down. I'm trying to think. Maybe some of my trenches are two feet down. Well, that bucket's really one to two feet down. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any higher than one foot. Then, you know, my, do my labs will go out and dig one foot deep holes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want them finding my ground rods. <laughs> Just some lights around, right? <laughs> <laughs> serves them right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's a summary. The key to effective lightning protection, and by the way, if you have a really good system for lightning protection, you're also probably going to have a really good system as an RF ground, and it will absolutely minimize the noise floor in your receiver. And keep, keep your equipment in your house and your neighbor's equipment from from excessively radiating into your system and causing noise floor problems. Um, use a single point ground. The voltage is induced by a direct strike. Or strike or, there's other transients, by the way, EMP, for example. Let's hope we don't get one. Uh, they're not controllable to reasonable levels, even with million dollar ground systems. And so the single point ground thing is really the only way to protect yourself. Probably. The whole house and the ham shack should float on single point ground. What's the ramifications of that? I've extended my power panel into my single point ground. Now I could do something really stupid. Mm -hmm. I could route an internet line, ethernet line, into my receiver coming from some other part of the house that's not going through the single point ground and being surge suppressed to that panel. You just spent who knows how much time laboring over a great ground system and a single point ground and you made the stupid decision to connect it to something else in your house. Don't do that. <laughs> Everything goes through the single point ground and needs to be surge suppressed to the single point ground. In other words, you have to do everything right to get this to work. You can't make any errors. Okay? But if you keep that in mind, uh, you can do it. The single point ground forces all ground and shield potentials to the same value. That's what protects you. Uh, the cert, because if you're touching your ham receiver and you're touching your rig runner or whatever, they both go up and down at the same time. There's no potential difference. <coughs> the cert suppressors hold the hotter signal leads to within the clamp voltage of the single point ground. It's not zero volts. It's going to be less than 100. But it's still good enough usually. To be successful, and this is the key point that I just made, all connections in the hand shaft must be referenced to the single point ground, i.e. the ground, the shield the thing has to be connected to the single point ground and the center conductor of whatever it is, cable, telephone, ethernet, power, has to be surge suppressed to the single point ground. If you do that, you'll be great, you'll be perfect. Note, a concrete basement floor may be an unexpected ground connection into the ham shaft. We're talking about getting rid of all parasitic ground connections into your home. Remember that your floor could be a problem. 
when wet particularly. I don't mean wet like water on the floor, I mean damp. Mm -hmm. Damp concrete is something of a conductor. That's it. And I gave a series of references here um, for those who are interested in digging into it. This, where is he? W8JI, one of the most knowledgeable peoples in the entire world of ham radio about grounding. Guy's been invaluable. I've spent hours and hours studying this stuff. He really knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the great thing about the ARRL. It's a very professional organization. The people who really are the movers and the shakers in the ARRL are all engineers. They're all electrical engineers. You're getting the best of what technology has to offer when you look at ARRL literature. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Okay.